So gravity probe B is a test of Einstein's theory. The first one actually ever done in which we are measuring the effects around the Earth. Gravity probe A also do that in a way. But So we make a perfect gyroscope. What is a gyroscope? It's a spinning sphere the size of a ping pong ball. And we point it at a star, and it goes in orbit around the Earth. There are two predicted Einstein effects. One of them is because the Earth slightly distorts space-time. This is called the geodetic effect. And we have, in fact, confirmed the Einstein prediction on that to just al almost a quarter of a percent, a little bit larger than a quarter, between a quarter and a third of a percent. The second effect is that as the Earth rotates, according to Einstein, it drags space and time around with it. This is a much smaller effect, much more difficult to get to. And we have verified that to rather better than 20%. Uh, and this is done by an experiment which has a telescope and four different gyroscopes, all spinning spheres. and. They all give results that agree with each other, which is why we are so confident in it. So <coughs> what does it mean that space is curved? When you hear this sort of talk, you think this is mystical talk. It really isn't at all mystical. What Einstein discovered was that gravity has the effect of distorting space and time. And that's really how, in his theory, gravity works. So what does that mean? Imagine drawing a circle 4,000 miles radius, and it was in empty space. And you would find, of course, in empty space, that the circumference of this circle is 2 pi times the radius. We all know that. But Einstein says that if you then imagine picking up the Earth and sliding it inside this 4,000-mile radius circle, if you could measure radius and circumference, it would be a little bit less than the circumference would be a little bit less than the 25,000 miles that we know is the circumference of the Earth. So then the question is, well, how much less? The answer is 1.1 inches. It's a very tiny effect around the Earth. It's a somewhat bigger effect around the sun. And of course, when you get to objects like black holes, um, it becomes enormous, except I don't recommend anyone to get near a black hole. And so our geodetic measurement is really uh, almost a perfectly close measurement of that effect. So we measured it to a fraction of a percent. And that means if you translate that back into inches, we've read the 1.1 inch difference to three thousandths of an inch. And that's a sort of rather remarkable thought. It is. The other effect, very extraordinary, is that according to Einstein, as the Earth it drag, it rotates, it drags space around us. You can picture what this means if you think of the Earth immersed in honey. And then you would picture the honey being dragged around with the rotating Earth. And if you had a straw or something in the honey, it would get dragged around with the Earth. Um, this is actually quite a good analogy. I, I mean, it really works in detail as well as in just giving you a feel for it. And that is a unique consequence of Einstein's theory. Very tiny around the Earth, but we have reason to believe that in astrophysical objects, certain objects that shoot out radar jets, it can be a source of an enormously powerful effect. Um, 38, 38 million watts, is that right? 38 times 10 to the 38th watts, which is a million, uh, 12 million, uh, 10 to the 12th, 
times more than the power of the sun. 10 to the 12th is a million, is a million times a million, or a billion times a thousand. You know, some of my friends, uh, when they hear about the experiment, and I say, well, it came out quite well, ask, well, have you proven Einstein right? And I said, no, we haven't proven him wrong. Now, would you like to hold forth on whether you can prove Einstein right? This is a matter of relativity. <laughs> you can prove that Einstein is more right than Newton. <laughs> Um, because these effects do not exist, exist in Newtonian gravity, they do in Einstein's gravity, and they and they come out with numbers very close to what the ex within the limits of accuracy of what Einstein predicts. But this, of course, is where we start landing ourselves into a deeper issue in physics: that Einstein's theory of general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, doesn't fit together with the rest of physics. So. It, Inherently, there are reasons for thinking it may not be the final answer. You mentioned students. Um, how many students? How many PhD students came? I, I think my count is correct. The, the total number of PhD students on Gravity Probe B have been <coughs> Just 100, 86 of whom got PhDs at Stanford, 14 at other universities, um, University of Alabama, Huntsville, um, University of Aberdeen in Scotland. They did a very interesting piece of work for us. And then uh, uh, three or four other universities, including Harvard and um, Purdue and um, Northwestern. So uh, that was the PhD pattern. I was more surprised to realize how much undergraduates could contribute, and I'm not absolutely certain of my number, but the count as best it came to 353 undergraduates, which included 11 different Stanford departments and also people from other universities who did summer jobs with us. And uh, high school students, I think the number is 55. <laughs> That's uh, that's quite a record. I suspect it is the uh, world record at Stanford for one program. And uh, the division of students is interesting because of that 86 at Stanford, 29 were physics students, one was a mathematician, and that makes 30, and the other 56 were engineers from different departments Mostly aero astro, but some from electrical engineering, some from mechanical engineering, and so on. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you might think that the one mathematician obviously was doing a calculation about Einstein. That's not correct. The most significant calculation that Einstein uh, was, for the point of view of running the experiment, was done by Professor Brakewell in the aero astro department, <laughs> <laughs> who uh, could calculate. Uh, the fact that the orbits are not quite circular and what that means. The mathematician was working on uh, problems of helium tides. Oh, yes. Uh, so, you know, we're all nicely mixed up together. Yes, yeah, spin-offs is a nice topic, and uh, I think it goes all the way back uh, to the s ceramic plug that you use in a doer, mm -hmm. because the problem with a doer is uh, as the liquid is boiling off and you're in free space, there is no up, and if you don't watch out, what happens is you blow the liquid helium out before it's given you mm -hmm. uh, or it's ab absorbed the heat that uh, you wanted it to absorb. So that device enabled a series of other scientific instruments. Uh, I think uh, that was a spinoff. 
certainly uh, in the case of GPS, we had Penny Axelrad, uh, now a professor at Colorado, who uh, did some experiments on how you would use GPS. And then along came another student and invented a way to uh, actually measure attitude as well as position. And that student was Clark Cohen. And next thing you know, we had taken that whole apparatus and concept, put it in an airplane, and it became the basis for a fully blind landing system. Mm -hmm. And that heritage, that trail, I think is, uh, is real clear. I think there have been uh, a lot of other examples uh, that that come to mind, but I I think those are the the two big spinoffs that strike in my mind. I, any come to your uh, well, there's a very interesting one, Dr. Jason Guo, who was working with us on the telescope developed, um, and that is bonding different parts of quartz together. I mean, basically, the way in which we've made this instrument is as far as possible, the whole instrument is a chunk of glass, fused quartz, but it's not made all in one. So you have to bond together different blocks of glass. And there's, there were methods of doing this which were not completely satisfactory. Jason, who was not only an optics person but had been a chemist, dawned on him that one could do uh, um, a chemical bonding technique and this has now been adopted worldwide in the optical industry. And as I remember when we tested it, once you bonded two pieces together, dead flat, you put this magic solution on there, and then tried to pull it apart, what inevitably happened is you tore the glass apart. You break it apart, right. So you had what it amounted to, the inherent strength of the glass. That That's right. So to survive launch, that was just the technique we needed at the time. Right. Well, I, I do think that the uh, experiment is a demonstration of tenacity. And we thought the tenacity was kind of all wrapped up when we saw the launch. And we saw that rocket go off, and it was a clear Vandenberg day, and it was a beautiful launch. And we all thought, wow, now all we got to do is take some data, and this thing is over. And then somewhere along the way, we discovered that when you try to push the city of the art by a factor of a million, there are some surprises. And uh, those surprises led to what has taken a long time to analyze it but the tenaciousness has paid off handsomely because anyone can now look at the reduced data and say, yeah, I think they did it. And, uh, you know, if we started all over again, we could probably even do it a little better, but I don't prepare to, I'm not prepared to do that. I don't know about you. No, and what was so interesting in this process is finally we understood what was going on, what was actually happening. So it wasn't a question of getting a blind data analysis and making right. things. We actually understood the physics of what was happening in the gyroscopes. Exactly. That was very satisfying. And Na important. Na nature makes sense. Yes. Maybe you have to work before it does, <laughs> but once we understood, it all made sense. Yeah.